Our next speaker is Jerry Ostreicher. He's an astrophysicist and professor of astronomy at Columbia University. 2003, he was appointed as Plumian Professor of Astronomy and Experimental Philosophy at the Institute of Astronomy, Cambridge. Dr. Ostreicher has been an influential researcher in one of the most exciting areas of modern science, theoretical astrophysics, with primary work in the area of interstellar medium, galaxies, quasars, and cosmology, particularly the aspects that can be approached by large-scale numerical calculation. Please welcome Dr. Ostreicher. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I have to do something like 13 billion years in 30 minutes, so <laughs> I have to talk fast. Um, and it's even worse in terms of space, because um, I, I need to go out from this room. We're now about to lift off to outside the planet, outside the solar system outside the galaxy, and so forth and so on, and carry you all along on that trip. Um, so don't hesitate to ask questions. The, the, I put together what is for me a very lucky lifetime. I happen to have lived in the ha and worked in astronomy and astrophysics in the half century in which incredible progress was made. Uh, if you, let's say at the end of Newton's life, um, there was a Tremendous strides have been made in a very short time to understand the solar system. And it held. Um, it wasn't replaced by general relativity. That added on something in another domain. But for 300 years, we had a good paradigm. Um, I think we may be in a similar state now. It's not that there will be no more progress, but that the advances in the, in the last 50 years have put together a picture of the universe which is very robust. Every time we make a prediction and check on something new and put up a new satellite and look to see whether our understanding is correct, we see exactly what we predicted again and again and again. And the simplest models turn out to be right. So it's, it's an astonishing 50 years of discovery which I'll describe. I decided to put it together in a book, a Heart of Darkness, about the subtitle is Unraveling the Mysteries of the Invisible Universe. Unfortunately, it's made out of very heavy paper, so that, um, it's very dense. Um, the Kindle version is cheaper, and I ha have the cards there, so if you're, that might be the best way to go. Um, so let me begin us now on this uh, cosmic journey, and let's see if it all works. What we're looking at here is a piece of the night sky, seen through the Hubble Space Telescope, this area is maybe a quarter of the size of the moon. And what we're looking at is almost entirely galaxies. Um, some near, some far. And it's odd that they cover some reasonable fraction. I mean, what would be your guess? A few percent of the sky? A tenth of a degree. What? A tenth of a degree or less. Yeah. So, but it's a few percent of the sky you can see. Now if it covered the whole sky, it would be as, the sky would be as bright as the sun is at night. But it doesn't. It isn't. So it just happens that that is the evolution of the universe to produce this array of galaxies looking very far out. And the big ones are relatively nearby, and the smallest ones are much further away. The yellow ones are old, and the blue ones are young. And we have some picture about how this all comes about. And I'll try to describe what that picture is. So here's my outline. And um, in any subject, the things that you understand and things that you know you don't understand. Um, and so I'm going to first talk about the answered questions, which is where we are in the universe and this history of discovery. What are the constituents? How did all the structure form? And say a word or two, not much, about life. And then, what is it that we don't know? And you won't be surprised to 
learn that what we don't know is bigger than what we do know, even if what we do know is a lot more than we knew some time back. Um, and it's useful to put it into some perspective. So I started out with um, the Renaissance uh, and there the discovery that the Earth is a planet revolving with others about the Sun rather than we being the center of the universe and the sun and the moon, etc., going around us and then the stars. And of course, one of the reasons for the problem was the orbits of all the planets are extremely complex and ridiculous if you treat them as going around the Earth because they go around like this in, in very odd loops. Um, if you put the sun in the center, it all works out a lot better. Then the next piece of the history was the understanding of uh, of fundamental laws. The idea that mathematics is, you know, 2 plus 3 is the same in Greece as, as in Rome or as in India. Um, things don't change. To, so those law, the, the some laws change, some laws don't change. I remember when I finished graduate school and was going to um, Cambridge, England as a postdoc, um, I told my relatives who lived in New York about this, and they said, well, you were studying astronomy here. Is it the same in England? <laughs> um, I said, well, I think so. Um, the stars shine down equally well, but, you know, the driving laws are different. We use the same word. You, if you drive on the same side of the road in England as you do in the United States, you have car crashes. But the laws of physics seem to be the same. Then the question is, well, are they the same not only in England and the United States, but on other planets of the solar system and other galaxies very far back in time? And the answer seems to be yes. I mean, it, you always have to test it, but the answer seems to be yes. Um, oh, while we're back, going back in time here, I, I was last in this building in 1949. Um, I, I went to the Ethical Culture School from third grade to sixth grade. And so I've been here, but not, but not recently. It was quite interesting. Um, then we'll go forward here uh, to the period when they, we lived in a galaxy, going from the Earth as a planet, physical laws, and then. So the first thing is putting us in our place. It's just one planet among many circling the sun and that an apple, a human, the moon, and everything all feels the same uh, as a force of gravity. It's very interesting, actually, if you read Galileo, he didn't do the experiments that, um, that uh, it's reputed in the, in the textbooks. They were thought experiments. He said, suppose you drop, in his uh, dialogue, suppose you drop a heavy stone on a light stone from the tower, which will fall, get to the bottom faster. So Simplicius answers and says, oh, the heavy stuff will get there faster. And, and, then, and then, then his friend asks him, but then if you tie the heavy stone and the light stone together, the light stone will prevent the heavy stone from falling as fast as it wants, and the heavy stone will fall to make the, the, stone, the light stone fall faster than it would have. Isn't that right? And Simplicius says, yes. So if you tie the two together, it'll fall intermediate between the velocity of the heavy stone and the light stone. And then Simplicius says, yes, looking puzzled. And then the, our, 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 re, uh, our inquirer says, but the two stones together are heavier than the light, either the stone, light stone or the heavy stone. So it'll fall faster. Isn't that right? And he says, yes. He says, well, now you've told me it falls faster and then it falls slower. It can't both be true. <laughs> and so they, that was his argument, a purely thought argument, for all the stones falling at the same rate. It's rather interesting. Um, here's Tycho Brahe uh, in the picture measuring star positions to a hundredth of a degree with a very early telescope. The light comes down and, and it hits on something. Uh, Kepler, um, Kepler puts the planets on ellipses with the sun at the center, not at the focal point, um, uh, initially. 
Um, and as you know, it, it all was worked out. One of the very interesting things was um, the famous Halley's Comet was after Newton, it came by and then it was predicted when it would come by again, following the elliptical orbit that it was on, and it came by exactly on schedule. There was a great hurrah, it was much in the newspapers of the time, when it did exactly according to prediction. Well, here's the universal law of gravitation, which explains the orbits of all of these things. Here's a Blake picture of it. He didn't really like this very much. Um, but, uh, it, in fact, he was quite annoyed by it, but realized its power. Okay, so now we're going to move out from that to the sun. Um, if you tell a five-year-old, if, if, if you say, what are the stars, and you say they're suns, it seems odd. It's not nearly as bright as the sun. But then you say, well, they're very far away. And people get it. Uh, uh, so the idea that all of the stars are, are, are the suns, well, that's rather interesting and plausible. And it was put together in the 18th century. Here's a picture. We're here looking out into the Milky Way, and when we look in the Milky Way, we see a large number of stars. And when we look perpendicular to it, we see darkness, and some of the stars are brighter than others. What were the spiral galaxies? This picture, um, oh, now I forgot who it is. Uh, I knew it a minute ago. But what's very odd about it is, it's a picture of galaxies, like the Andromeda Nebula. And there's an eye in it. Well, when I first saw this, when, when I first saw this picture, um, I wondered what was on anyone's mind in drawing it. Consciousness of galaxies. Um, but now we know that the center of every massive galaxy is a massive black hole. There's one in the center of our galaxy. We do not know how they form, um, when they form, but they must have been turning on and off, and it must have been noticed because they do vary in brightness. So that's probably the origin of this odd picture of the galaxies with an eye in the middle. But people in the room may have better ideas to know the history of it. So the spiral nebula that we're seeing, they avoided the Milky Way, um, and Kant speculated that they were island universes, and there were very big telescopes were built to look at them carefully. So here's Lord Ross in Ireland with a great telescope. Here's his drawing of M51, nearby galaxy, with a satellite. And here's a modern picture of it. Um, it uh, it's pretty good. Now, of course, what were they? No one knew. Um, and we now know they avoid the Milky Way. They avoid the Milky Way because, by the way, could people hear me when I didn't have the microphone on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just using it as a way. <laughs> okay. Um, we now know why they avoid the Milky Way, why you don't see galaxies in the Milky Way. It's because there's dust and gas in the Milky Way and it obscures things which are outside of the Milky Way. So in fact, the galaxies surround us on all sides, it's just that they're obscured in the Milky Way. So now let's go fast forward to Hubble. So here he is. He was a great faker. Um, it's interesting. He had his picture taken in daylight when he could. You couldn't possibly observe it, otherwise you couldn't get the picture. Um, but he did get money to build giant telescopes. And this is a very early figure of his, hand drawn, of the distance away of different galaxies from us compared to the velocity that they have with respect to us. And they're all going away, and the ones that are further away from us have higher velocities. And he drew a line through it. Now there are various things that are interesting about this. So that's the famous Hubble law, that the velocity of something receding from us is proportional to the distance from us and the constant we call H for Hubble's constant. Um, because he was the first to make this plot. 
And that's the idea that the universe is expanding. And it's basically the same as if you, you know, one homely example is to say if you make a bread pudding with raisins in it and you stand on any raisin in the oven while it's cooking and it all expands, all the other raisins are going away from you. Um, or if you paint dots on a balloon and blow up the balloon, all the other dots are moving away from you, no matter which one you stand on. And the velocity in which they move away from you is proportional to the distance from you, automatically. It's just a ge simple geometry. Um, the interesting thing is, he didn't take any of this data, one. And two, he didn't realize what it meant. Um, there, there, there was a Russian physicist who, who um, a actually understood it all. Um, a slifer took the data. So then the question for a very long time was this. Okay, we live in a universe. The external galaxies are made out of stars. We live in a galaxy. There was a huge debate at one, uh, where, when it was found that we live in a galaxy and we're on the edge of a galaxy. Um, but it was one, it was clear, the data just accumulated that there's many more stars on one side, there's a disk of stars, the galactic clusters are centered around this, uh, Sagittarius, etc. So we lived in a galaxy very much like Andromeda, and you all see pictures of Andromeda, the nearby galaxy. So, then it turns out that all the galaxies are moving away from each other and the further away they are from each other, the faster they're moving. So now if you extrapolate backwards, um, then they were all much closer together and you compute there was a finite time ago on the order of 10 billion years where they were all on top of one another. That was the idea of the Big Bang. Um, it wasn't in the infinite past that they were, everything was very close to one another. So, um, after this was assimilated, the idea was, well, there was a Big Bang for whatever reason, uh, whether or not it was understood. And then, for a long time, it was sort of thought the galaxies came out of that. But then you realize, whatever there was in the early times, it wasn't galaxies. The galaxies are formed at some later time. So then you had to worry about how the galaxies were formed. Um, and that became another, the whole subject changed. But at this point, we're now in the, in the 50s, it was, the question was, would the expansion continue? So the balloon is blowing up, and would the expansion continue? But gravity would, would make it, the expansion slow down. So if I throw this up, um, it, the harder I throw it up, the longer it takes to come down. If I throw it up fast enough, it'll escape the Earth's gravity. So then the question was, if the universe is expanding, it should be slowing up, and you expect it to be decelerating, expanding slower now than it did in the past. Um, and that seemed to be consistent with the data we had. But then the question is, will it stop expanding, or will it expand forever? So that was what they were concerned with, and they built the big telescopes at that time, to see if they could tell by observations whether it was true. Now, Einstein didn't know about the, uh, the slightest discovery which was told to Hubble of the expanding universe. And so, in the 20s, even after it was quite not well known, you know, in Arizona and other places where they observed these things, that the universe was expanding, Einstein still had a picture of the static universe that, that Galileo and Newton had. And so, if the galaxies are out here, and they're just like this, then they're going to collapse and fall together by gravity. So how do you prevent that from happening? He didn't know that it was actually expanding. You have to invent a force which pushes them apart and balances gravity so that they stay at a fixed distance from one another. So Einstein invented the cosmological constant. The cosmological constant was a completely fictional force for which there was no evidence that would oppose gravity and push things apart. And there, was, there were a couple of things wrong with the invention of the cosmological constant. First of all, he was trying to do something which wasn't necessary. 
uh, because in fact the universe wasn't static, it was expanding. Second of all, the universe he invented was wildly unstable. There was a Russian mathematician, Friedman, who showed that. Because if I take these two and balance gravity and this outward force, and I bring them a little closer together, gravity wins and they come together. If I push them a little further apart, the cosmological constant wins and it blows them apart. So the static universe that Einstein invented with the cosmological constant um, wouldn't have lasted at all. It would have been completely unstable. So it was afterwards that he said it was the biggest blunder he had ever made. Um, but it was invented, the cosmological constant, and you couldn't get rid of it after that. Um, so people still ask, well, is it there or is it not there, even if it was invented for a wrong reason. Um, then there was a question about the universe, which is purely geometrical. So um, you could ask as a geometrical um, question, if I draw a triangle on a globe of the Earth, and then add up the angles, it adds up to more than 180 degrees. If I draw it on a plane, you all learned in, in ninth grade, it adds up to exactly 180 degrees. If I draw it on a saddle, um, it's less than 180 degrees. So the geometry of space is something which we could be almost anything, and you have to check and find out what it is. We're used to it being, so to speak, normal, 180 degrees. But it doesn't have to be that. And there was an open question, is the universe flat? Closed would be like a sphere, open would be like a saddle, or flat would be like this plane. So, it, then they got very big telescopes, and optical observers used the big telescopes to estimate the cosmological parameters, and try to determine what the nature of the universe was. Would it expand forever, etc. Um, but at the same time, sort of in left field, radio astronomers found something which no one was looking for. Um, and it was quite bizarre. They found out some completely different things which no one had been looking for. And they saw the found the cosmic background radiation field. And then um, people said, well, if everything started out small, then it was whatever temperature it is now would have been much hotter then. If you take something in a, in a in, well, you know in a bicycle pump, if you just push down the bicycle pump, the air in it gets heated. And so if the universe um, was much smaller, then whatever the temperature is now was much higher then. And you would actually cook, nuclear cooking of the chemical elements. And so you could compute what would have happened, and thereby make a prediction of what would have happened in the Big Bang, if there was a Big Bang. And then, people realized that whatever the galaxies were, they weren't there in the beginning. So you have to find a way of making them. And a, a young woman astronomer, who was right out of graduate school, Beatrice Tinsley, um, was the leader of this. I don't have a, a, a slide on it, but it's very interesting. Because, just as we saw a picture of Hubble, Sandage was the most famous astronomer at the time, and he was looking at galaxies as a function of dis distance from us. And the further away they were, the fainter they would be. And he was using this um, to determine the geometry of the universe and whether the universe would expand forever, etc. And she pointed out, well, the galaxies weren't there in the beginning. They evolved. The stars in them get fainter and die with time. And, um, and it threw a monkey wrench into the whole effort to use galaxies to determine the universe. Because all of a sudden we realized the galaxies weren't standard candles and standard meter sticks in size, and that we had to take into account their evolution and origin. And then the whole subject changed to trying to figure out what was the origin of galaxies and their evolution. So this is 1965, um, Arno Penzias and Wilson getting the prize. But they were just experimentalists. They, they, there in Homedale, New Jersey, uh, looking across at, uh, to Manhattan, across the Hudson. And they were um, using a big radio antenna to see whether they could see satellites, Earth satellites, uh, efficiently 
Um, but they wanted to have very, very good receivers, which were very quiet. And so they put the latest technology for the receivers, but no matter what they did, there was always a buzz inside of this. Thing. So the receiver is in here. And they couldn't get rid of it. Um, so there was, they, they actually thought maybe there were pigeons in there that were doing something. There was, it was just impossible to make it really quiet. It wasn't interference from, uh, from other buildings around or airplanes. Um, and then the question was, the realization is that it was coming from outer space. That radio signals were coming from us broadly based from outer space. And the story of it is quite interesting because and this is telling a tale out of school. Um, Bob Dickey at Princeton had realized that, that if there was a big bang, there should be radio signals in the universe, and had built a, an antenna which he had put on a physics building at Princeton, which was about as big as this, I saw it at the time. And they got signals, but the signals were not strong enough to be really sure. So he was working away at this. And then his student, Jim Peebles, some of you may know the name, this is 1965, uh, was on a plane with uh, Wilson. Well, Wilson was saying, we can't get this, we can't clean up our antenna. Um, and uh, Jim Peebles said, look, you've discovered the Big Bang. <laughs> And Wilson and uh, Penzias and Wilson published first and got a Nobel Prize for it, which you see here. Um, at the same time, Peebles actually calculated, once you know the temperature, then if you extrapolate back, the temperatures are much higher. And then you just take the ordinary elements that you have around us and put them in the oven at that temperature, and it cooks. Um, it's nuclear cooking. And you can predict what the amount of helium Lithium, uh, 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 lithium, beryllium, boron, and deuterium would be, and the numbers come out right. So this is 1966 or something like that. Um, so that was direct evidence that the Big Bang actually happened, an additional direct evidence, because the light elements that we find, well, the light chemical elements, look like they, the abundances were just what you'd expect if they'd been processed through the a Big Bang at an early time. Okay, now, so if Hubble is standing here and looking out, he's just counting galaxies. But this was Margaret Geller in the 70s realizing that when you did this and plotted each galaxy as a function of distance from us, they weren't uniformly spaced. There was all this structure. There was this great wall of galaxies. There were filaments. There was this homunculus here. There were voids. There was all this structure. And so people said, where does all the structure come from? So you had two questions on structure. Where does the structure in the galaxies come from? And then the next one, which is deeper, is where do the galaxies come from? Because if you started out with a uniform mixture of gas, it would have to lump up into, into objects to, to make galaxies. How did that all happen? And then, the only way you could think of for doing it, the only forces that act on large scales, so if I hold this, this chemical forces between my hand and this a clicker here, but on large scales those that work, the only thing that works on large scales is gravity. So you had to imagine that gravity was responsible for all the structure that you see in these pictures. But then the question is, what's that gravity due to? If you just take all the stars that you see in all the galaxies, each dot here is a galaxy, and say, how much gravity does it amount to if each star is like, if each, all the stars in the galaxies are like our sun, um, you fail by about a factor of 100 to make enough gravity to move things around. So. It was just a mystery what produced the structure. So at the end of the 60s, so now um, up to 50, a half a century ago, and I'm in graduate school, um, <laughs> the Big Bang model seemed to be correct. But the matter density 
was much less than the critical density. The amount of density was the amount of mass in stars, gas, planets, all the things that you can see. Um, it, was too, it was not enough to be very interesting. And then the structure that we saw, galaxies, clusters of galaxies formed, was unsolved. And, and in fact, it was even unaddressed at that time. They didn't even realize it was a problem. So now we'll fast forward to 75 to 95. Well, we have to go back to a very interesting and eccentric Swiss astronomer, Fritz Zwicky, um, who said that there was something, and he called it dark matter in 1937. My German isn't very good, but I could read his early paper where he says that, that in the clusters of galaxies there's dark matter. Then there were rotation curves, and then halos of galaxies, um, and then finally the perturbations were found in the Kobe satellite. So this was a picture that Zwicky took, 1937. Here is a cluster of galaxies, and all of these galaxies are running around, you find their velocities. Here's a big giant one in the center, and there might, if I went much further out, there might be a thousand galaxies in this cluster. And from their velocities, it, you know that they must, they can, they can cross the whole thing in a small fraction of the Hubble time, the age of the universe. So it must be that there's something holding it together. Um, something is doing it, and the only thing we could think of was gravity. So then you say, okay, how much gravity does it take to hold this thing together with all these things buzzing around in it? And you conclude that the gravity has to be a hundred times more than the gravity produced by this many stars. So he suggested there was quote unquote dark matter in that um, at this 1937. So now this is work that I participated in in the 70s. Here's our, our, our neighbor Andromeda, and it's there's its center and it's rotating around. And you can plot the velocity of rotation. And this is the rotation velocity as a function of distance. Now, if you take the velocity, take suppose, let's consider our solar system. Put the sun there, and you have Mars, Earth, Venus. The velocities of each one of them is less than the one in interior to it. They're all rotating slower than the ones it's inside it. And, um, and what that means, and you calculate the mass of the sun for each planet, and you get the same answer because, in fact, the centrifugal force balances gravity for each one of them with a lower velocity. So the same thing was expected for Andromeda. But the rotation curve did go up in the center and then flattened down. And then from that you could calculate how much mass there was. So this was the total mass in Andromeda. Well, it goes up from here to here, and you can see there's lots of light from there to there. So that's reasonable. But it keeps on going up. And there's much, much more mass between here and here. But there's no light. So this was very direct evidence that, that, um, that there was some mass in the outer parts of galaxies. I had to speed up. I'll try to do that. I, um, so we plotted the mass in Andromeda, in our, our system versus the distance. And we got a huge increase where this is what we thought the galaxy was. And we say the, 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 uh, the mass of spiral galaxies increases almost linearly with distance out to a megaparsec, 1974. And this was a paper arguing for the existence of dark matter, um, which on the basis of this. Well, so the idea essentially is that Van Gogh had it right that his picture of the stars and the galaxies with these halos around them were essentially correct. Where he got the idea from, I don't know. Uh, so we have dark matter and the chemical elements, and we have the equations. And so now we can put them to computers and see if we can compute. Um, now, at about the same time, a satellite went and looked up, and not just at the little bit of radiation that gets through the Earth's atmosphere, but the whole spectrum. And not only that, but it got a picture of the whole sky and showed the fluctuations 
in the early universe, which this is looking back in time, which later on grew to be the galaxies and clusters and everything else. So there was direct evidence for not just the Big Bang in the other picture, but the structure in the universe. These fluctuations were really only a hundredth of a percent. They're shown here amplified greatly. They've been predicted by uh, a Rus Russian, a very famous Russian physicist, Yakov Zadovich as, and uh, Rashid Sunyayev, um, as well as Jim Peebles. So we have a picture of an early Big Bang, which we don't understand. Then the elements are formed. Then the elements combined. Then at that point, this is where the radio emission that we can see is. Then the galaxies form. And then we see them from here, and we look back <coughs> like this. So that, that's the cartoon of the universe, because all of a sudden we realize the galaxies weren't standard candles and standard meter sticks in size, and that we had to take into account their evolution and origin. And then the whole subject changed to trying to figure out what was the origin of galaxies and their evolution. So this is 1965, um, Arno Penzias and Wilson getting the prize. But they were just experimentalists. They're, they're, they're in Homedale, New Jersey, uh, looking across at, uh, to Manhattan, across the Hudson. And they were um, using a big radio antenna to see whether they could see satellites, Earth satellites, uh, efficiently, um, but they wanted to have very, very good receivers, which were very quiet. And so they put the latest technology for the receivers, but no matter what they did, there was always a buzz inside of this thing. So the receiver is in here, and they couldn't get rid of it. Um, so there was, they, they actually thought maybe there were pigeons in there that were doing something that was, was just impossible to make it really quiet. It wasn't interference from, uh, from other buildings around or airplanes. Um, and then the question was, the realization is that it was coming from outer space. That radio signals were coming from us broadly based from outer space. And the story of it is quite interesting because this is telling a tale out of school. Um, Bob Dickey, at Princeton had realized that, that if there was a Big Bang, there should be radio signals in the universe, and had built a, an antenna which we had put on a physics building in Princeton, which was about as big as this, I saw it at the time. And they got signals, but the signals were not strong enough to be really sure. So he was working away at this. And then his student, Jim Peebles, some of you may know the name, this is 1965, uh, was on a plane with uh, Wilson. Well, Wilson was saying, we can't get this, we can't clean up our antenna. Um, and uh, Jim Peebles said, look, you've discovered the Big Bang. <laughs> <laughs> and Wilson and uh, Penzias and Wilson published first and got a Nobel Prize for it, which you see here. Um, at the same time, Peebles actually calculated once you know the temperature, then if you extrapolate back, the temperatures are much higher. And then you just take the ordinary elements that you have around us and put them in the oven at that temperature, and it cooks. Um, it's nuclear cooking. And you can predict what the amount of helium, lithium, uh, 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 lithium, beryllium, boron, and deuterium would be. And the numbers come out right. So this is 19. 66 or something like that. Um, so that was direct evidence that the Big Bang actually happened. An additional direct evidence. Because the light elements that we find, well, the light chemical elements, looked like they, the abundances were just what you'd expect if they'd been processed through the, a Big Bang at an early time. Okay, now, so if Hubble is standing here and looking out, he's just counting galaxies. But this was Margaret Geller in the 70s 
realizing that when you did this and plotted each galaxy as a function of distance from us, they weren't uniformly spaced. There was all this structure. There was this great wall of galaxies. There were filaments. There was this homunculus here. There were voids. There was all this structure. And so people said, where does all the structure come from? So you had two questions on structure. Where does the structure in the galaxies come from? And then the next one, which is deeper, is where do the galaxies come from? Because if you started out with a uniform mixture of gas, it would have to lump up into, into objects to, to make galaxies. How did that all happen? And then the only way you could think of for doing it, the only forces that act on large scales. So if I hold this as chemical forces between my hand and this a clicker here, but on large scales those don't work. The only thing that works on large scales is gravity. So you had to imagine that gravity was responsible for all the structure that you see in these pictures. But then the question is, what's that gravity due to? If you just take all the stars that you see in all the galaxies, each dot here is a galaxy and say, how much gravity does it amount to if each star is like, if each, all the stars in the galaxies are like our sun, um, you fail by about a factor of 100 to make enough gravity to move things around. So it was just a mystery what produced the structure. So at the end of the 60s, so now um, up to 50, a half a century ago, and I'm in graduate school, um, <laughs> The Big Bang model seemed to be correct, but the matter density was much less than the critical density. The matter density was the amount of mass in stars, gas, planets, all the things that you can see. Um, it, was too, it was not enough to be very interesting. And then the structure that we saw, galaxies, clusters of galaxies formed, was unsolved. And, and in fact, it was even unaddressed at that time. They didn't even realize it was a problem. So now we'll fast forward to 75 to 95. Well, we have to go back to a very interesting and eccentric Swiss astronomer, Fritz Zwicky, um, who said that there was something, and he called it dark matter in 1937. My German isn't very good, but I could read his early paper where he says that, that in the clusters of galaxies there's dark matter. Then there were rotation curves, and then halos of galaxies, um, and then finally the perturbations were found in the Kobe satellite. So this was a picture that Zwicky took, 1937. Here is a cluster of galaxies, and all of these galaxies are running around, you find their velocities. Here's a big giant one in the center, and there might, if I went much further out, there might be a thousand galaxies in this cluster. And from their velocities, it, you know that they must, they can, they can cross the whole thing in a small fraction of the Hubble time, the age of the universe. So it must be that there's something holding it together. Um, something is doing it, and the only thing we could think of was gravity. So then you say, okay, how much gravity does it take to hold this thing together with all these things buzzing around it? And you conclude that the gravity has to be a hundred times more than the gravity produced by this many stars. So he suggested there was quote unquote dark matter in that, um, at this 1937. So now this is work that I participated in in the 70s. Here's our, our, our neighbor Andromeda, and it's, there's its center and it's rotating around. And you can plot the velocity of rotation. And this is the rotation velocity as a function of distance. Now, if you take the velocity, take suppose, let's consider our solar system. Put the sun there, and you have Mars, Earth, Venus. The velocities of each one of them is less than the one in interior to it. They're all rotating slower than the ones it's inside it. And, um, and what that means, and you calculate the mass of the sun for each planet, and you get the same answer. Because, in, in fact, the centrifugal force balances gravity for each one of them with a lower velocity. So the same thing was expected for Andromeda. 
But the rotation curve did go up in the center and then flattened down. And then from that you could calculate how much mass there was. So this was the total mass in the drama. Well, it goes up from here to here, and you can see there's lots of light from there to there. So that's reasonable. But it keeps on going up, and there's much, much more mass between here and here. But there's no light. So this was very direct evidence that, that, um, that there was some ma mass in the outer parts of galaxies. I had to speed up. I'll try to do that. I, um, so we plotted the mass in Andromeda, in our, our system versus the distance, and we got a huge increase where this is what we thought the galaxy was. And we say the, 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 uh, the mass of spiral galaxies increases almost linearly with distance out to a megaparsec, 1974. And this was a paper arguing for the existence of dark matter. Um, which on the basis of this. Well, so the idea essentially is that Van Gogh had it right, that his picture of the stars and the galaxies with these halos around them were essentially correct. Where he got the idea from, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so we have dark matter and the chemical elements, and we have the equations. And so now we can put them into computers and see if we can compute um, now, at about the same time, a satellite went and looked up, and not just at the little bit of radiation that gets through the Earth's atmosphere, but the whole spectrum. And not only that, but it got a picture of the whole sky and showed the fluctuations in the early universe, which this is looking back in time, which later on grew to be the galaxies and clusters and everything else. So there was direct evidence for not just the Big Bang in the other picture, but the structure in the universe. These fluctuations were really only a hundredth of a percent. They're shown here amplified greatly. They've been predicted by uh, a Rus Russian, a very famous Russian physicist, Yakov Zadovich as, and uh, Rashid Sunyayev, um, as well as Jim Peebles. So we have a picture of uh, an early Big Bang, which we don't understand. Then the elements are formed. Then the elements combined. Then, at that point, this is where the radio emission that we can see is. Then the galaxies form, and then we see them from here, and we look back <coughs> like this. So that, that's the cartoon. We had the initial conditions, the mathematics, the computers. We could compute. We, and so the first ones we did we're at about this time, and here's a, this is an ancient one, here's a dark matter simulation. And you see the formation of structure, and then here's the same thing with gas. And it's very similar, so this is the dark matter, this is the gas, um, and when we did that, and then we plot the temperature, we got these hot x-ray cluster things that should have been emitting large amount of x-rays. And then, this is an example of such an x-ray cluster, which was seen by the ROSAT telescope, which was exactly the kind of thing that had been predicted from the simulations. So we knew we were on the right track. And it's hugely luminous. So then we looked at the structure in detail. And um, this is the famous cosmic web pictures. And the little dots, which it's hard to see in this resolution, the galaxies are these little spot, brown spots at the centers where the filaments intersect. And this was, at that time, the biggest simulation ever made. So here's a walkthrough of the dark matter simulation. Then you could make predictions that if you look out and there's a cluster of galaxies, you could see things behind them which would be lensed by this, and so you'd see two images. And here's examples of it, where we're seeing the same galaxy here and, and probably here, and it's been lensed by this cluster of galaxies. 
It was an effect that Einstein was an effect that Einstein predicted and was now found in gravitational lensing. Now I'm up to 2005. I'll have to get to 2015. It won't take me that long. <laughs> um, there were lots of evidence that, that the things were not quite right. That the standard model had the universe older than the stars. Um, and then we looked at distant supernovas, the universe was not decelerating, it was accelerating. It was expanding faster and faster. Very puzzling. Um, and when we looked, the total amount of matter was much bigger. Matter and energy was much bigger than the, even the dark matter gave. So there was some other ingredient. And it turns out, it was Einstein's cosmological constant. It was really there. So, um, it's quite mad. We don't, I, I walked into Ed Witten's office um, in, in 1995 and said, well, gee, it seems to be there. He said, it's impossible. Um, the, 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 because the cosmological constant was quite a mad idea. But it turns out, empirically, it fits all the observations. Uh, and that's what we call dark energy. So there are three phases. Early inflationary, which we don't understand, then dark matter dominated, and now it's starting to speed up and it's dark energy. So in the 1950s, we only had the ordinary stuff that we see around us. By 75, we had the dark matter. And by um, 2000, we had the dark energy. And it was exactly the critical density to make a flat universe. There's no room for anything more and it matches the high precision. So now we could actually look back at this original picture and we could see whether we could make the galaxies with the evolution. We could use the universe as a time machine and see when galaxies were formed. And then, and this is a wonderful movie, if I can make it work. Mike. Well, I'm short of time, I, I want to show it. Uh, it's a wonderful movie of galaxy formation, but it makes something that looks just like this real galaxy. Uh, I mean, so, so this is in detail the model. This is in detail the model. And I don't want you to pay any attention to anything except to notice that the numbers in the model, there are not a lot of them, and the numbers have errors which are small compared to the number. So when we make a basic model for the universe now, it's quite precisely, it's like planets in the solar system, where we know quite well what, uh, what they orbit are. So we have a definite model with dark matter, ordinary matter, and dark energy. Okay, so now I'm done with cosmology, but what about locally? And I only have one slide for everything local. Um, in our own Milky Way, there were many more discoveries. We found that in the center of our Milky Way, there's a four million solar mass black hole. How it got there, we don't know. What it's doing, we don't know. In the center of Andromeda, there's one, oh, about a factor of 10 more masses. Every galaxy seems to have one. Every massive galaxy seems to have a massive black hole in the center. What they're doing, we don't know. They erupt every now and then. How were they formed? I'm working on it. They erupt as quasars and do dramatic things. They become as bright as the whole galaxy, because we know that from looking at other galaxies. Uh, what it'll do to us if that happens, I don't know. Uh, can we see it now eating gas and stars? Okay, that's our own galaxy. But we also, have the Kepler satellite, those of you who have computers with you can look up Kepler satellite, has looked at nearby stars and found that every nearby star has planets. When I went to graduate school, the only star that had planets was our sun. People speculated that other stars have planets. Now we know that every star. A huge variety of planets. And then there's the question, is there life on any of them? We don't know. Now the fact is, life started out very early on our planet. Um, so, 
I don't mean intelligent life, but the first single-celled animals, or uh, plants, were very, very early. So it doesn't seem as if it took too much to get it going. And right now, we're looking very hard to see if there's oxygen on any of the other planets, because that would make it easier. Let me end on this with the Fermi paradox. Did anybody ever hear of the Fermi paradox? Okay. Fermi paradox is very interesting. Um, Michael Fermi was an extremely smart man. He said, well, this was in the 50s. He said, it's likely that there are other planets. Um, why should our star be special? And now we know he was right. It's likely that some of them are at the right distance away for, to have life, and now we know that that's true. So, if there's life, and we know life started on our planet very early, so, um, why wouldn't there be life on these other ones? So then, what about intelligent life? Um, being able to go from place to place. Well, we can already see signals. We could see our own planet all the way across the galaxy by the signals we're emitting with the radio telescopes we have. So why don't we see them? In fact, in a short time, we'll be able to travel from place to place. So. What, what's the, where are they? So the, the summary of the Fermi paradox is, where are they? And we can leave it to the discussion, but it's a, the, the question is, the more you think about that question, the more difficult it is. So let me just sum up now. Conclusion. The hot Big Bang model seems to be right. Most of the matter is in dark matter. There's also dark energy. Um, and uh, the cosmological constant. And in our own galaxy, planets are everywhere. Okay, next question is, do we understand the cosmos? Okay, the general picture we have works well. There are little details, and I'm working on some of the details now, which don't fit. But of course, we've said this before. Um, and it's interesting, we haven't found that we were wrong before. It's just that what we knew was incomplete. In other words, we didn't revise it the way the periodic table when we added dark matter, we just added the dark matter. So in some detail was a clue to an omission, something was ignored. So my guess is this will happen again, maybe not soon. But there's something much bigger. All the big questions that you would talk to with your five-year-old daughter, granddaughter, grandson, are unanswered. The past, what was the origin of the perturbations? What, how did it all stop? What happened before the Big Bang? Does that question even make any sense? We don't know. That's the simple answer. There's lots and lots of papers being written. But no two people agree even if the questions are sensible. Um, the present, what is the dark matter? What is the dark energy? The primary constituents, we have no idea. They're just labels for something that we know exists. The future, will there be surprises? Um, Will it just expand away or something else happen? What about intelligent life? Of course, the fundamental question, which is there intelligent life on Earth, we haven't been able to answer. <laughs> and reading the newspapers is not reassuring. Um, but is there an intelligent life elsewhere? We don't know. Then there's the anthropic principle. Has anybody here ever, ever heard of the anthropic principle? One person. It's very interesting. Um, so I'll just say what it is, and then we'll leave it to the questions here. Suppose you say that there is an ensemble of different universes, and they have different values of the gravitational constant, they have different fundamental uh, speed of light, everything else is different than all of these. Um, then you ask, could we exist in those universes? No. They, you wouldn't have the structures that we have. Um, in order for us to exist, things have to be just right. And so, the answer to the question of why the universe is as it is, is that we're here asking the question, why is the universe as it is? That's the anthropic principle. Some people think it's very wise and profound. Some people think it's complete rubbish. Um, uh, and that some people think it's neither one of the two, just empty. Um, I'm sort of in the third category. This is a
a good place to quit and leave the rest of the time. <laughs> We're running out of time as usually, so we're going to have a, like a four questions from audience, please. Okay, can I be the first one? Jerry. <laughs> uh, question. I'll look like it. Yeah, my, my question is Jerry, very simple. Is any evidence of the uh, multiverse from the scientific point of view? Is there any evidence for the multiverse? They can't be. Because if we could see it, then it's part of our universe. <laughs> okay, so the, the multiverse is an extremely interesting concept, but it is by definition not testable. Even if a string theory prediction. But it, that would be a prediction, because there could be any evidence. Because if you could see it, then it's connected to our universe. Uh, Jerry's book is available in the back, so everybody can purchase for autographs. Okay, three more. So I had brought up this question a little bit when Ben was presenting, but regarding the it from bit, uh, John Wheeler's uh, it from bit hypothesis and how Seth Lloyd and some other folks now may be thinking that really the universe is a, a computation, right? And that's what, what's fundamental is, is information. So I'm wondering... Do you know what Samuel Johnson said about that? He kicked and said, it's real. Well. So there's, so there's always this, uh, when the same question came up in uh, about 1780, I think it was. Yeah. Are we discovering math or do we create it? Because it's, it seems that... Did I hear your question or did I imagine it? <laughs> yes. I just kind of wanted to know. Have you all, you talked about how fast the planets are going fast. How fast is the mass, our own mass, going through the universe if you chose a point? Is there a way of telling? You have to say with respect to what? That's what I mean. If Your velocity with respect to me is quite small right now. <laughs> okay. Um, but if you do from, so there's no, there's no the frame, the there's no absolute frame. That you can pick and say what are the velocities with respect to that. If you extrapolate it back to the Big Bang, uh, but there isn't a spot. The whole okay. universe that blew up. Yeah, so this. Yeah. We should have a little more. Before. Yes. Are you familiar with in the last three decades of the 19th century, during the same period that Nikola Tesla, there was an American by the name of John Laurel Keeley. I need a field called sympathetic vibratory physics. There's a website devoted to it, and there are engineering applications. Have you ever dealt with or come across any of the, shh, shh, shh. Sorry. Have you come across any of that language or approach? His work, many people felt Tesla stole a lot of his ideas and went a different direction. But the whole field of sympathetic vibratory physics is that. Has that come up in any of your research or any of your colleagues? It's a very easy question to answer. My answer is no. <laughs> it hasn't come up. <laughs> yes? Hi, yeah, I, I saw um, a lecture recently at the Natural History Museum where they were actually doing spectro uh, spectroscopy on stars by, uh, sorry, on planets, remote planets by occulting the light from the star. Um, do you think that that might lead to actually yes. detecting? Yes. By the way, some of these things that you've seen are actually in the natural AMNH. Some of these videos. The question is, can you do spectroscopy on nearby stars and find from them what the planets are made out of, and is there oxygen? Yes, that's very important work, and may tell us whether there's a good chance of life. Yeah. Uh, can you speak to a couple questions just on the arrow of time? Is time something that is baked into the universe or something that's sort of a consequence of our perspective? And is it just a consequence of entropy? Is it fundamental? And is there a reason why the future of the universe seems like it looks different from the past? Um, it's a very profound question. There's no doubt about what the arrow of time is now. Um, 
And it is interesting to ask, if you see a movie of things, can you set tell whether it's in, it's in the right direction or the wrong direction? Okay? Is it somebody showing you the movie backwards or not? And for some things you can, and for some things you can't. If there's a swing going, well, if it comes down like this slower and slower, you know that you're seeing it the right way. If it's going faster and faster, you know it's the wrong way. If somebody's shuffling a deck of cards, and the more they shuffle, it comes out A, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know you're seeing it moving backwards. That's entropy. So things do go into, um, basically what in increase of entropy says is, things go from a less likely to a more likely state. Not surprising. Uh, Jerry, thank you very much. Okay.